Oh, this is lovely. So we're going to do uh, old school. So we're all recording from home today, dear listeners. So we're going to do a little uh, old school intro with Liam. Liam, I'm going to give you a little intro music here. Go oh. ahead, buddy. The Edmonton Oilers beat the crap out of the LA Kings yesterday. Da-da-da-da-da. I can't think of anything else. Uh, the rat list grows every. Uh, Alberta's rat <laughs> for the LA Kings come, and then their entire team is rats. <laughs> I expected a better. I expected a better chant out of you. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's great to hear, the podcast. It's hard to hear the music. I can't <laughs> hear the music when I talk. I could have cranked it up for you. I finished watching uh, Full Swing yesterday. The crowd at the Ryder Cup was very clever in how quickly they came up with their chants about the hats for uh that thing was great or whatever like it was everybody on that side of the world they are very very quick on their uh, their chanting and their singing at sports at sporting events i would have gone because of how hot it looked when he was there i would have gone hat on Pooh bear though no pants <laughs> until the the guys get paid for the Ryder cup you know well, i feel like you might get a uh, a really bad sunburn well just something to consider, you know? Rather have a sunburn on me legs than the heat stroke on my head. Welcome yeah, to Other Nature. I wasn't expecting the legs. <laughs> well, we're not, well, full poo bear? Well. All right. Welcome to Other's Nation Radio. It's Friday. Gang is all at home today. Bag Milk, Tyler, Rick, Liam, Dan is on the road driving to parts unknown. <laughs> give you a little dose of Oilers talk anyway this morning because we're just good for it. Whereas we do every week, we're going to start off with a delicious debate for our friends at Wendy's. But first, I need to tell you about the Cinnabon, uh, the Cinnabon Pull Apart from Wendy's. The only thing sweeter than the taste of victory is starting your day with a new Cinnabon Pull Apart from Wendy's. Anybody had one yet? I have not, but I should. Five bucks for a small coffee and a Cinnabon Pull Apart all day? That's unreal. Come on, that's pretty good. There's no reason you can't have both now that Wendy's and Daily Face Off Fantasy are giving you a chance to win weekly prizes all season long. And hey, even if you make a few wrong picks, at least you know heading to Wendy's right now for a $5 Cinnabon pull apart and a small coffee is a great choice. Sign up for Wendy's Daily Face Off Survivor today at dailyfaceoffsurvivor.com. Sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. Go download that. Get yourself some points and work your way towards some free food. Normally, I lean on Tyler for the delicious debate, but I want to ask you guys a question after last night's win over the LA Kings, which we're going to get to in a minute. The Oilers currently have 11 games left on the season. I think my math is right on that. Yep, mm-hmm. it is. I want to know. We're getting close to clinch, miss. Do we have a... Is it magic number yet? Where's I Matt? Know, I, know. I need him. Check I want it. I think he's yeah, at 11. Yes. I was like two games ago, I think. Oilers magic number is down to nine points. So we got nine is the magic number. So clinch miss is just around the corner. So I want to ask you boys a little piece of NBA thoughts. Should the Oilers and Chris Knobloch consider load management for some of the star players down the stretch after Clinchmas is wrapped up? As you're thinking, looking at the standings right now with the win over the LA Kings last night, the Oilers are at 92 points. They're four up on Vegas. They're five up on LA. By no means is this clinched yet. The job's not done. But it's just around the corner. Tyler, what do you think of a little load management for the Edmonton Oilers? Um, like I think it's fine, but I also think, you know, you want to be peaking at the right time and playing your best hockey down the stretch. So I think there's a time and a place for it when it comes to specific players, but I wouldn't be doing it like the day after you clinch or anything. Uh, I would be looking at that season ending set of back to backs against Arizona and Colorado and being like, okay, I think maybe you can rest a few guys in Arizona. You can rest a few guys in Colorado. The other thing, too, is coming second in the division is crucial for this team. And obviously, the win last night goes a long way for Mm -hmm. all of that. But until they have home ice advantage, I'd actually probably say I don't want to think about it at all. Rick? Uh, Yeah, you know, it depends on the player. I think most uh, most Mm -hmm. would benefit from a uh, game off or two. But at the same time, you got to secure that home ice advantage. Uh, After that, you can think about it. But I think most guys don't want it. So you might turn into a thing where you play him like seven, eight minutes instead of to give him the game off. But I don't think you'll see anybody really get a game off. Well, at least the big guys anyways. Tyler mentioned the Colorado Avalanche as one of those last games. Nathan McKinnon's home point streak ended last night. Oh, did it? Yeah. Last night it got wrapped up. Liam, what do you think? Load management. Yeah, I, 
I'm kind of with Rick and what he said on the back half, where I don't see guys taking games off. I could see them just playing less five on five and more special teams, I guess, stuff like that, right? Like maybe the second unit gets a couple extra minutes or something like that on the power plays to start just in the third period if they're up. So I think it'll just be dependent on the game. Like if they're up by a few goals going into the third period, then yeah, I think guys will, they'll just be four lines rotating through. But I don't see anyone taking games off until maybe that final game. But there's a lot to play for still. Like we keep, debating if the Oilers are in this race for first in the division and now all of a sudden I think they're six points back again with two games in hand maybe that's too few I can't remember but there's a lot to play for so I I don't think they'll do much load management right now until maybe the last five games Vancouver Canucks have lost their last two games currently the Edmonton Oilers are six points back two games at hand you win those two games you're two points back and we play it one more time don't we and yeah. we play them one more time. And we have the tiebreaker. Uh, that is not a guarantee, actually. What's the so the tiebreaker is a reg win. Yeah. Yeah. The so. first tiebreaker, according to the NHL website, is the greater number of games won in regulation. So um the Canucks right now are at 39. The Oilers are at 34. So if you win your two games in hand and then you beat the Canucks, which again is what you'd have to do to get close or to tie them then it's close. You're still two back, though. So, yeah, the Canucks probably hold the tiebreaker. The Canucks actually have the most in the NHL. The most regulation wins in the NHL, which is mm -hmm. nuts. And, like, the stupid thing about the Oilers is they should be right there with them. I can't think of too many, but, like, the one against Montreal the other day where, like, they should have just beat Montreal. Did not want to go to overtime. And then Winnipeg, too. It's just, like, close out a couple of games, and it's... It's kind of a small detail in all of it, but at the end of the day, if it comes down to that, there'll be some moments that the Oilers wish they could have back to just close out games better. Mm -hmm. I just think of the month of March in general, and I think of the loss to Columbus. I think of the loss to mm -hmm. Buffalo. And those are the ones that stick out. You're not going to win every game, of course, and the Oilers have done more winning than they've done losing, but when we're talking about catching the Canucks, those are the ones that kind of stick out to me. And yeah, there's been a thought I was crazy when I said they could do it. I didn't. I'm right there with you. I'm always on the Kool-Aid. <laughs> but even like five days ago, we kind of sat there and we're like, yeah, probably not going to happen. But then like you just kind of look, it's things can flip in an instant. Like last night was the equivalent of a four point win over the Vancouver Canucks, right? Because they lost you one. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, shit, like we have a pretty easy matchup coming on Saturday against the Anaheim Ducks. Like if that's one of your games in hand, all of a sudden you're inching a lot closer if you win it. So it's interesting how things can flip. So the losses right. from March that stick out, unfortunately, when it comes to just, you know, you need the points. Obviously, October, that's the sore thumb in all of this, mm -hmm. right? They had like a 250 win percentage or some garbage like that back then. But in March specifically, you got the loss to Columbus. That one sucks. You got the 3-2 loss to Buffalo. Could you use that extra point? That one was in the shootout. You've got the 5-3 loss to Ottawa. Gave up a, a two-goal lead there. So those are the ones that stick up. The loss to the Leafs, they just played like junk. So you write that one yeah. off, you flush it, and you move on. But it's going back to October now. Like those October losses are the ones that are kind of that they're kind of paying for, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. The uh the Canucks upcoming schedule, they play the Ducks on Sunday, and then they play Vegas, Arizona, LA, and then Vegas. So Should they got be? a tough schedule for them. So they the others obviously got they got the Anaheim Ducks tomorrow and then St. Louis on Monday, Dallas on Wednesday. That'll be a big one. And then next weekend. They've got Colorado on Friday, the Flams on Saturday. Do you think that putting their goalie on LTIR was just some sort of move in order to get a backup in there? Or is he, uh, so is he, do you think he's ready? Is his first game back going to be the first game of the playoffs? No, I talked to our pal Jeff Patterson from Canucks Army and Rink Wide Van, and it, it was a cap move because Lindholm needed to be day to day, so they had to call up a forward. Uh, yeah. But I think the plan still is to have Demko back and activated off LTIR with like four to six games to go in the regular season, and they want to get him two or three games in the regular yeah, season. Yeah, that's what I would have figured. You want to get him a couple before you get to the playoffs. Yeah. So I guess for people that don't know, too, you can. When he went on IR, they can say that's when he started LTIR, right? Yeah, you go retroactively. Retroactively, yeah, yeah. that's the word. I hope that this break on the shelf for Demko, just a little rust there, you know? Just It'd a be little. nice. Well, the rest of the team's breaking down, so why not the goalie, too? Hey. Like, go ahead, Tyler. 
Yeah, I was just gonna say while we're on this conversation about like you know finishing where or whatever, you pass the Canucks. I don't think if you pass the Canucks, you really have a shot at catching Dallas. They're very far in front of you now, nine points up to the first team in the West to clinch. So if you finish first in the Pacific, you're getting wild card team number one. Who would you rather play in the first round though, Nashville or potentially LA? I think I'd rather play LA after what we I'd watched last night. LA. Nashville's like the thing with Nashville is like they caught fire down the stretch here. And that's with the Saros and net. Like we saw what happened last night. You know, dad bought former friend of ours. He still holds most a uh, record for most wins in a season with the Oilers from the 2017 run. So we mm-hmm. love dad bought to an extent. But last night you see that Oilers had four goals on what? 20 some shots. Yeah. I don't know that that happens against Saros. So to answer your question specifically, Tyler, I'd, I'd take the Kings all day. I would too, but I do think the Oilers could beat either of those teams comfortably in six Great. games. Like Great. Soros yeah. is really good for sure, and I don't doubt the National Predators can do it. But I think at the end of the day, the offense might just come through for Edmonton. It's kind of a bit overpowering. They also have the mayor of Nashville on the roster. Like, who knows what Leon Draisaitl could do against the Predators in a seven-game series? You know. Yeah. Well, I Nashville think they have, have a tough schedule too. They have Boston, Avalanche, St. Louis, and then the Islanders, and then the Devils in their next five. So we'll see what they're kind of made of over this little stretch. I know they just went on like 18 games of a point, but it's a tough little, tough little. I think I'd rather take on Nashville for two reasons. One, because at the end of that 18 games or whatever, you tend to have a bit of a dip. I mean, you saw us after our big one. I think we went five and five or something like that. Um, but the second is, I don't know if it'd be as physical. There's no real hatred there between Edmonton and Nashville that is there between Edmonton and LA. LA is gonna they're gonna bruise you. They're gonna mm-hmm. there's there's some hurt feelings from the last couple of years, and you could see guys getting injured in that series. And well, I think I mean, I mean, with Nashville, yeah. I, just, I don't think there's that same animosity. The Kings are just dirty all the time. Like Drysdale got slew footed again last night. I can't believe it was a penalty against him. It's so stupid. Well, Tyler tweeted it, the ref show. Tyler tweeted it last night. That's what it was to start off the game. It was wild. Yeah. And then it evolves into prison rules, but that's what we get when the Edmonton Oilers are playing. I had this theory last night. I was just sitting here thinking, and I was just like, watch. In 10, 15, 20 years, something like that, there's going to be a bunch of emails or text messages that get leaked about the Oilers' power play and how they did not want to give them additional power plays because they're so lethal. I'm like, I'm almost banking on it at this point because some of the missed calls on the Oilers, there was a point where Connor McDavid had the puck on his stick and he got tripped and fell right in front of the ref at his feet. And they're just like, ah. Okay. That was great. That was a crazy one. So the thing uh, that just the exact same thing. Yeah, the thing that really frustrated me, like, okay, so they call Drysaddle for the retaliatory slash. It's like, okay, yeah, technically he slashed him, but like, I don't know, man. Blake Lazat's probably been spanked harder in bed. Like, what are we doing here? And then Arvidsson is just able, hey, pause. Arvidsson's able to just go give McDavid like three free shots while the play's going on in the corner and they're on the other side of the ice. And Arvidsson cross checks him like three times and the refs are like, ah, rivalry game, gotta let him play. And it's like, okay, now we're letting him play. Like, what? Yeah, the, the, who knows what the rules of hockey are anymore? Yeah, I thought I did. I thought I did too. I've been watching the sport a long time. I played it when watching it, consume it, write about it. Have no idea what's a penalty, what's not. Could be anything. You know what I do know? For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. That's 25% off, $10 value, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the promo code NATION25. Don't forget, code NATION25 gives you 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change. Terms do apply. DoorDash has an amazing selection of local gems and the staples you need in a hurry, too. You can try something new or get your favorite comfort dish delivered right to your door. Get the Double Dash going. Two stops, no extra fees. Come on, it's a long weekend, gentlemen. Why not relax a little bit, put your feet up, get our friends at DoorDash hooking you up with a couple of little stops. Liam, if you're going to order some breakfast right now via our friends at DoorDash, what are you getting? Um, The Grand Slam, probably from Denny's. Oh, you're practicing for the golf thing? 
<laughs> yeah, I've tried to put that out of my head, but I probably should get some reps in before I <laughs> sit down for 24 hours. I don't know if eggs are going to travel very well. That's always my, my thing with all breakfast. Well, I just get them scrambled. Well, that's fair. That'll work. I actually accidentally made scrambled eggs the other day, so I'm not much of a chef, mm. as you can imagine. Accidentally, okay. So, what were you trying to make? Just a, I don't know, an egg. I just like, cracked an egg and I put it egg? in. <laughs> I just put it in the pan and I'm doing my stuff, and all of a sudden things start to get a little loose. I'm Next not saying, I'm not saying I'm a good cook by any means, but I crush eggs. I murder eggs. Well, I made these great scrambled eggs, and I loved them. Now I make them all the time. Yeah, you got it. You put a little cheese in there, or no? A hundred percent, hundred percent cheese, a little salt, a little pep pep. It's great. You got it. You got it. But gentlemen, I want to know who delivered for you. We did an episode on Tuesday, so you had a couple of days of your life go by. A couple of Oilers wins. They had a big OT win in Winnipeg. They had the big win last night against the LA Kings. Tyler Uremchuk, you're first up on my screen I'm looking at. For our friends at DoorDash, who delivered for you? Who delivered? I mean, 4-1 dub. Actually, you know who I want to give some love to in this one? He, He scored a big goal, so like that obviously helps and keeps him in your head. But I thought Evan Bouchard early on in that hockey game was bringing like a real solid amount of like physicality and kind of nastiness. Like he was going after guys. He was cross-checking guys. He laid a big hit, which I feel like we barely ever see him do. So I thought Evan Bouchard, like going into a rivalry game, I thought he kind of stepped up to the challenge a little bit and was like, Hey, I'm not going to be pushed around. Like I'm going to be a bit of a prick. So that was good to see. And the goal, obviously. I would love if Evan Bouchard got 15% meaner. That would be awesome to watch. So I like seeing that too last night. Rick, for our friends at DoorDash, who delivered for you? I've said his name before since he got here, but Corey Perry, man, that guy just keeps doing things. And if it's not on the scoreboard, you know, he gets in the fight in Winnipeg. He heads into the box to give uh, Nursey a little tap afterwards. We all saw his quote from however long, however many days ago. He's the epitome of what you need in a playoff player. And I just think... I've wanted him here for a couple of years now. I've wanted him here for a long, a lot longer than that. But I absolutely love what he brings to the game. And the only thing I wanted was after um, Stu got run last night, I wanted to see Corey Perry end up in their crease a couple of times and just do Corey Perry things. But what he's been doing right now, I think it's, it's a massive addition to this team. Shout out to Corey Perry last night, game number 1300 in his NHL career. That is a lot of games. The interesting kind of stat that they put out on the broadcast, or maybe it was on social, I don't remember. Last night was his 80th career game against the LA Kings. He's basically played a full season of hockey just against one team. It just shows how long he's been around. And to Rick's point, I hate, there's part of me that really dislikes how much I enjoy Corey Perry because for how many games he played with the Oilers? 26 now. For most of those 1,300 games, Corey Perry has been very annoying around here. And it is fun watching him do it on our side. He just does a lot of stuff that's annoying. Like his constant, he'll get like a hack or something and it makes me laugh all the time where he just grabs someone's stick and he tries to rip it out of their hands. He does it all the time. Makes me laugh. He's annoying. That's the exact kind of player I love to have the Oilers or have on the Oilers. Liam, our friends at DoorDash, who delivered for you? I'll say Skinner delivered. He was really good last night, and I thought he had a pretty good game against Winnipeg, too, especially in that first period. So he's had a good week, a good bounce-back week after a very disappointing game against Toronto, but he's a really good goalie, and I think we need to trust him a lot more than some people do. You know who delivered for me, and he was not taking heat. That's the wrong way of putting it, but some people were getting a little bit nervous about how much production or lack of production that Adam Henrique had in his first couple of games. We talked about it. We weren't worried about it. Our friend Colby Cohen from Morning Cup of Hockey said, listen, give the guy a couple of weeks to settle in. He doesn't have his family. He's living out of a bag in a hotel. Like, Give him a minute. Now he's got three goals in his last six games, and the thing I like most about those goals that he's scoring is they're just they're greasy. They come as a result of going right to the net. So his first one was the tap in in the crease from the pass from Matias Ekholm. The second one was a lucky bounce off his skate into the net. That's from charging the net. Last night, he's parked right in the crease again. Drysidle hits him in the chest, bounces in off his chest into the net. Those are just, to me, those are veteran goals from a guy who knows where he needs to go to score some greasy ones. And it can't all be Zach Hyman in the crease. Adam Honorique deserves a little bit of love, so he delivered for me. I think he's playing some good hockey, too. He's just sneaky good. He's fun to watch. 
I yeah, agree. I'm with you. <laughs> I was waiting for someone else to go first, but like he's not. And I, I like the way Cam put it on Oilers Nation every day on Thursday. It would have been, but like he's not an at home level addition where you're going to sit there and be like, wow, like look at the impact he's making every night. But what he did, he raised the floor of the team, right? I know Carrick hasn't played in a couple of days and he was a part of that deal as well. But like just having Henrique on the ice, he doesn't make mistakes. Maybe you don't notice him every single shift or every single period. But sometimes not noticing a guy is also pretty good. So the fact that Henrik goes out, plays mistake-free hockey, can play center, play the wing, help out on the penalty kill. Like he just checks so many boxes and raises the floor of the forward group. Love that. Adam Henrik deserves a little love. By the way, Henrik and Drysaddle, all the same line. That's too much handsome for anybody to handle. Kings couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle that smoke. Who can? No wonder, no wonder Talbot couldn't stop that puck. He was just looking at their beards. Of course. They're very, very handsome. Both of them. It's a lot of handsome on one line. Anybody else stick out as uh, other names that we didn't mention that delivered for you? I mean, you can always look at the captain. Like I just, he keeps closing the Art Ross race. He keeps closing the uh, the assist race. Like that dude just, he doesn't stop. Every day is every day you get the best out of him, and that's not something you see out of players. Connor McDavid last night had a goal and two assists, Rick. So that extended his point streak to six games where he has now put up two goals, 14 assists for 16 points. He's up to 95 assists on the season. He's at 122 points. He is only two back of Nikita Kucherov. Connor McDavid is doing very, very Connor. McDavid Can he still win the heart? Does he like, is, is it an auto heart if he gets hundred assists? Cause I know at one point people are kind of talking about that. What if he has the hundred assists and the art Ross? Is that a heart? I mean, it puts me just Nate here because I what Nate has done all year has been absolutely phenomenal, and I think taking the heart away from him is very difficult. But at the same time, what Connor's doing is, dude, three other people have done it ever. My yeah. thing, my, ever. my worry with Connor is always voter fatigue in a sense. Like Nathan McKinnon's having a hell of a season; he's been doing it all year. Even though Connor is going to, you know, in my opinion, allegedly pass him and just win the Art Ross again, I just think it's probably McKinnon's to lose this year Tyler Liam thoughts I, I don't know like, I also think McKinnon's easily the, the favorite but with the way McDavid's going what if he passes him by like 10 12 points you know <laughs> like, like what if you get to a point where we get to double digit a double digit gap on the Art Ross race you know and it's just like what are you gonna think right now yeah like how do you not and I know McDavid's goals are down but to get 100 assists and like being able to to get Zach Hyman to 50 like the scoring on the Oilers for their star guys like goal scoring is down like Nuge didn't score is right McDavid's down by like 30 goals dry saddle's not going to hit 50 this year like I don't know maybe it should be way more of a debate than it really is right now and we shouldn't just hand it off to Nathan McKinnon yeah, I mean, you look at the way, like just some McDavid stats here. He's got multi-point efforts in eight of his last 10. He's got three or more points in five of those last 10 as well. He's now, like you guys said, two back of Kucherov, one back of McKinnon, but he's got one more game to play than Nikita Kucherov. He's got two more games to play than Nathan McKinnon. And he's got some games, like you got the Ducks coming up. Like, what's he going to do to the Anaheim Ducks on Saturday? He could very easily put up four or five points against the Anaheim Ducks. So, um I I do think if you gave me even money on all three of them, I would put a lot of money on Connor McDavid. I think if I was making the odds, I'd be putting McDavid as like a minus 180 favorite to win the Art Ross. I think he's put himself in that kind of a spot. Like you go and put up five, 14 points in five games. Like, yeah, that you deserve to be the favorite. You can do keep he can keep doing this. But yeah, I, he can and he has. He's proven that he can do it. And the interesting thing too is even what was it, probably like a week ago, he was eight, nine, ten points behind Kucherov, and people go, Oh, that's quite the gap. And then Connor just goes and does Connor things, and it all of a sudden that gap is gone in a hurry. Well, you do I think four or five his. points in a game, and you turn the game off, you look over at Tampa Bay and Kucherov did the exact same damn thing. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Maybe we can look at it, the odds for that, Tyler, if they've changed for the courtesy of our friends at Bet99 when we get there. I want to go look at last night's win over the LA Kings because, number one, they're 1-3-1. One, one. They can call it whatever they want. That's the trap, and it's fucking boring. Rick, you're going to remember watching Minnesota Wild games when Jock Lemaire was the coach, and does that not remind you of watching those old Wild games? It does. In New Jersey, back in like the mid-90s when they were winning their cup, were doing the same. Well, they were doing a different uh, bit of a trap, but... 
I spent all night last night just yelling, hey, guys, you're allowed to forecheck. Nope, you're not. It is it, like they just abandon the forecheck and then settle into that like T, essentially that T formation. It is wild to watch. But did the Oilers kind of find the recipe for getting around it last night is the question I want to ask, Tyler. Uh, I think they've kind of developed that recipe over the last couple of years. And and my thing for LA, I had this conversation with Gregor yesterday um, and he was like, you know, do you think the Kings will ever change up the way they do things? Cause it's clearly not working. And I know Jack had the line on the broadcast of like, you can call it a rivalry, but for it to be a rivalry, you got to win once in a while. Mm. And I know the Kings scoop up their little regular season wins here and there. And once in a while, the one, three, one does work. Like if the Oilers aren't, sharp and on their game offensively we we saw them get shut out by the kings like it can work but i think when you have edmonton la in a best of seven series i just think the oilers offense is it's due to have nights where it clicks and when the offense clicks and you're going up against a team that's playing such a passive style of hockey and they're sitting there and their whole game plan is to basically just hope you don't convert on the chances you get I don't know, man. I don't think that style of play from the Kings works in today's NHL anymore. And to see them continue to do it even after the coaching change leads me to believe they're never going to change their ways. And I just think that makes it even easier for, like you said, for the Oilers to, they know the recipe, they just got to keep doing it, right? And that's what we saw last night. That We've seen them play that style of game against the Kings before, and it worked before. And the Kings don't have the ability, even within game, to adjust. Like when they go down by a couple of goals, all they did last night was throw a bunch of pucks on net from the outside for the most part. They don't actually have the ability to like generate a ton of quality in their offense or suddenly start playing with more pace. Liam, what do you think of the trap? I think it's boring. Yep. And I would like them to stop so I can enjoy my hockey in the first round this year. <laughs> it is funny too, like more players recently have been speaking out how shitty it is <laughs> the LA well, Kings slot into that one three one. That it's interesting it for like a free agent perspective too. Like, I wonder how many players are going to be able to recruit over the next few years. Like, I know that they've been able to draft and develop, and that's that's good for them and everything. But like, why would you want to go and play there? You're not going to like rack up a ton of points, to like get you more money down the road. Like, I wonder if this could also harm them at some point. No, well, you get to live in LA. <laughs> yeah, but also the taxes in LA are brutal. So like, there's actually like a lot of layers and like they're never going to get past the first round because they're not better than Edmonton. They're not better than Vancouver. And when Vegas is healthy, they're not better than Vegas. So you're always going to be the fourth or worst team in your division because of the way you play. I mean, it's just, it's painful. It reminds me of Jacques Lemaire. And I hated those Minnesota Wild teams, and I hate the Vancouver, uh, the uh, LA Kings. Before we move on from last night's win over the Kings, I'd like to check in on the rat list. Every year, going into the playoffs, Tyler Uremchuk goes through rosters and develops his rat list. Now, Liam mentioned this earlier. The Kings are good at just developing and promoting their own internal rats, even if they trade some away, as they did to the Winnipeg Jets. Tyler, I'm going to ask you to look at the Los Angeles Kings roster because I see a team again last night, another example of them just being dirty. Who you got on the rat list this year for the LA Kings? Well, they added Pierre-Luc Dubois, and he's interesting because if he gives a shit, he's like a really good rat, but he quite often just doesn't give a shit. So it's hard to include him in the list. I will say there's a couple of guys who are, they're very clearly at the top of the rat list. Like you have Mikey Anderson who loves mixing it up. And then the second you touch him, he acts like it's the worst thing anyone's ever done to anyone mm -hmm. in a hockey game. And the other guy is Blake Lazat. That dude, he's listed at five foot, five foot nine. I think he's honestly five foot four. And he runs around and he just does his greasy little shit to try to get under the skin of the Oilers. And there was a moment last game that I loved. And there was a scrum right in front of where I was sitting. And Warren Fogle like popped him up by the jaw. And Lazat just immediately crying. He's holding his jaw and he's looking at the ref being like, what the hell? <laughs> then as soon as he moves his hand away, I think it was Henrique who just came in and popped him right in the same <laughs> spot. Almost like Henrique was sitting there watching him being like, oh, your jaw hurts. Your jaw hurts. He moves his hand. Boom, gives him another one. So I hate Blake Lazat and Mikey Anderson more than anyone else on that team. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have a ton of rats. I mean, Drew Doughty. Yeah, he's he's brutal. But again, like 
I, and he's annoying too. Like that cane hit, that was a penalty to start the game. How that's is because it? Doughty was scared and decided to jump out of the way and then flop. Like that's all it was. It, how, how did he call tripping? Nothing. I want to know. Nothing below his waist made contact with anything below Doughty's waist. It was that's terrible call. Awful call. Like you see, the, I was just like, so Kane gets called for tripping. I thought I missed something else on the play. Like after the hit, I'm like, oh, did Kane knock someone's legs out or something while he was skating away from Dowdy? That's what I thought. And then they show the replay of Dowdy trying to jump out of the way of the hit and Kane gets penalized for it anyway. Very, very annoying. Do you remember what Gabe Velotti said about Lazat? Yes. The start of the season. No. Um, so Lazat injured Velotti. Yes, and I can't remember what he did, but Velotti was out for a while, and basically when he came back, he was like, "If you guys knew who Blake Lazat really was, you would know that wasn't an accident." All this stuff, and after seeing last night, like I don't pay attention to the LA Kings until they come to Edmonton because, again, it's very boring to watch them. But he is just like slew fighting dry side all. Like mm -hmm. you can say he got caught by Cody CC going into the net, but also he still rammed the goalie at the end of the day. It's just stuff like that. Someone needs to be that guy to a pulp. So Gabe Bellardi, Blake Lozot were teammates for, I mean, it would have been three or four years in yeah. LA. Um, Blake Lozot hurt him and it kind of looked like an accident on the play. So when Velarde came back to the lineup and they're playing the Kings that night, so what a reporter asked him, was it just, is it, was it frustrating being out that long with something that was a freak accident? And he said, I think you could say that, but at the same time, no. Personally, I think it's a play that doesn't need to happen, but what am I supposed to do now? I've played with him a lot. He's done a lot of little things like that. It's stuff you guys say it was an awkward fall. It wasn't an awkward fall. It's someone pushing your feet out from the back, slew foot. My knee gets caught under me, and then he tackles me. It's that simple. Uh, he keeps going on, and they asked, did Blake reach out and apologize to you? And he said, that's between me and him. I'm not going to get into that. So um, Blake Lazat, not exactly very well liked, I guess. Mm. Uh, another thing just on the rat list, you mentioned Mikey Anderson again. I loved, I know he got a penalty for it, but I loved the cross check to the ribs from Hyman. Oh, it was yeah. just like he leaned into him real good with us. Like he had a free one at the ribs. And he took it and I loved it. I love when the Oilers play sassy. Makes me happy. A guy who was playing sassy last night, Tyler, you mentioned him before we started recording. Vander Kane had another really solid night for the Oilers. He was running around that first shift. He took a run at Dowdy. Dowdy was the one that tried to jump out of the way, but that's a couple games in a row since the healthy scratch, maintenance day, whatever you want to call it at this point. Kane's playing some pretty good hockey despite not actually getting on the score sheet. He loves getting up for those LA Kings games. Like from the first shift, he was engaged. He was taking extra strides to finish his checks. And that's the kind of Evander Kane that the Oilers need, right? Like sometimes he becomes a bit too much of a passenger, but him waking up for that game was a very welcome sight. Um, he ended up with a shot on net. So not as great offensively as maybe, or as strong offensively as he was against the Winnipeg Jets when he had six shots on net at five on five alone. But I thought he had a great game, man. He was doing what makes a Vander Kane effective, getting under the other team's skin. And I thought he had a decent night with the puck on his stick, even if it didn't translate to a ton of shots. I like the line with Corey Perry and Ryan McLeod. I think that on both sides, you've got two veterans who have been around a long, long time. McLeod's got all the wheels you need in the world to go get retrieve pucks or just even transport the puck through the neutral zone. I like the way that line's looking right now. Yeah, you, know, you definitely don't want to play uh, against 90 and 91 at the same time. No, like, they're both. If you line up and you look on the, you're lining up at center and you look on your left and your right and you see both those guys out there at the same time, dude, I'd be looking for a line change right now. Those guys are going to, they're going to get between your ears and it's not going to be a fun time out there. And then when they are messing with your head, they're going to do something that's going to hurt you too. They showed a little clip on the broadcast and it was just a nothing kind of clip, but it was those two. Kane and Perry getting off the ice for a line change. And as it was kind of like the players were crossing at the doors, kind of. So there was Kings going off, there was Oilers going off. And you see Corey Perry, he goes to grab someone's stick or do whatever Corey Perry does. The guy kind of turns around to see who's doing what. And right as he turns around, Evander <laughs> Kane gives him a quick cross check. Those two are incredibly annoying to play against individually. When they're out there together, they cause mayhem. And I love to watch it. If they I think, can get a little bit of offense going between those three, all of a sudden that third line is a real problem. I think one thing that would be interesting with that pair and playing together going forward too is what Perry said the other day about checking your ego at the door and just coming to play. Like maybe Perry can 
balance of Andy Kane a little bit on, on that side of things. I like I said, I, I think he's played well recently, mm-hmm. but maybe they can just kind of spark something in each other by being dicks every time they go out on the ice and creating some havoc. There's there's a Bash Brothers mentality to that, and I think that if Corey Perry, like, listen, Rick said it, Corey Perry's bringing a lot to the roster right now, and I don't know that there could be a greater benefit than having him voice those opinions like, like, let's check our egos here. We're on the third line, but let's go make the most of it. Like, that kind of stuff could go a long way. It kind of reminds, right now. It reminds me of, I don't think he was as vocal, but when Duncan Keith was here and the effect that he afterwards right like there was a, a big hole that felt like it had been left and Corey perry has seems to have filled that and has been more vocal about it we're saying stuff like yeah check your ego at the door we're here to do a job and he's been able to score what's he have does he have six goals for the others now or is that too many I think perry? A, yeah i think he has six that goals pick. i think that's high he's just like quietly he contributing brings, he brings that stuff that you really can't measure he's got six yeah. he's got he's six got three assists nine points in 27 games so he's just, contributing. Like he's not playing a ton of minutes. This isn't Corey Perry that won the Hart Trophy we're talking about, but we're talking about a guy who's a veteran who's kind of done everything you can at the professional level. And now he's coming in and contributing with some key goals and some moments where every single night you notice Corey Perry being Corey Perry. And it's fun hard. to watch. And and when the playoffs come around too, like he's a, if we do play LA, he's going to also draw some penalties or take some guys to the box with him by doing stupid shit. Like he did take, trying to take sticks and stuff like that. The, <laughs> the Kings are going to be pissed about it. Like it's we talk so about fucking annoying, but it's going to be great to see that happen in an Oiler Jersey. We talk about the Kings rat list. while like the Oilers now have the King rat <laughs> on their team and it's Word. fun to watch him do his thing. You know, I want to get into a little betting talk. My friend Tyler Uremchuk is looking at some re- odds from our friends at Bet99. Uh, Bet99, of course, they are the number one online gaming experience in Canada. They're built by Canadians for Canadians. Experience Bet99, same game parlays. Player props, flash bet markets, fast payouts, and smooth transactions. Provided that you are 19 plus, can play responsibly, and not a person in Ontario. Our friends at Bet99, they've got the odds to bring you closer to the action. Download the app. Bet nine nine. Tyler, what do you got for us? First off, I cleaned up betting on the Toronto Blue Jays yesterday. I'm very happy that betting on baseball is back. My favorite baseball bet is betting on pitcher strikeouts. That leaves you on the edge of your seat the entire game because every time your pitcher gets a guy to two strikes, you're up. You're like, come on, come on, give me one here. And then when you're one strikeout away, ooh, that's a good sweat. Jose Barrios coming through. He did come through. He exactly hit his number. It was five and a half. He finished with six. Uh, All right. To the hockey stuff, looking at their futures tab right now. We talked about the race for the top spot in the Pacific Division. It is all of a sudden a race once again. The Oilers, six back of the Canucks, two games in hand, and a head-to-head matchup still to go this season. Uh, Let's do this. I'm not going to tell you guys the odds. I'm going to ask you for your percent chance, and I'm going to see how close you get. To the odds. So, Liam, what do you think the percent chances that the Oilers catch the Canucks? Uh, well, I'm, it's obvious why he didn't go to Rick because his answer is 100. Um, <laughs> I will say, <laughs> I'll say, I think they have a really good chance, but it's all down to themselves. I'll just go high so people leave me alone. I'll say 75%. <laughs> I think 75% chance they catch there the Canucks. You go. The yeah, sure. Why not? I've doubted him all season. I've said Connor Brown would score another goal for the Oilers. You know, right. three. That last yeah. goal was I'll a say beauty one too. It was. It was a really good goal. So seventy-five percent they catch the. What are they called? The Vancouver, Vancouver losers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rick, what's your number? <laughs> we're doing it, man. We're taking that spot. I've said it all the time. I think we're getting it. I just don't think Vancouver can hold on right now. And with the games that they have uh, ahead of them, I don't see them holding on to the first spot. All right. So, Rick's, I'm assuming 100. you're saying 100. BM, 100. what do you think? I'm telling Rick with 100. I want it. Give it all to right. me. We, Rick and I, are the Kool Aid drinkers on the podcast recently okay. and have been all season. And I need you two to get on our level for a while. We're manifesting. We're manifesting another banner going up there. We got a bunch of banners that we need to hang up next season. And this division win is just the first. Uh, Our friends at Bet99, not as optimistic as you two that the Oilers will catch them. They have the odds at plus 210, which translates to 32.26%. So 32% chance is what they're giving the Oilers, plus 210 odds. But 
hey, if you guys think it's going to happen, that sounds like free money. Free, free money, money to me. Uh, also, uh, Hart Trophy. They do have updated odds on that. Nathan McKinnon's running away with it. He's a minus 280 favorite. Kutrov's in second at plus 500. Connor McDavid is in third at plus 550. So they're saying Connor McDavid about a 15.3% chance of winning the Hart Trophy this year. They don't have odds on the Art Ross, which is a shame because I would love to bet on that. Yeah, what do you make a, BM, what do you make a plus 550 for Connor McDavid to win well, the Hart? I, I can see myself dropping a couple of shekels on a number like that. You know, I feel like I don't bet against Connor McDavid doing anything. And if he can go out and win me a little bit of money, again, the Oilers have 11 games left to play. Who knows what he does in 11 games? In his six-game point streak, he has, what did I say earlier, 14 points, 16 points? What did I say? 16 points. Like, who knows? games and get him 25 to 30 points. We could all be think about, but it's not that out of the realm of possibility. We could be looking at the end of the season going, fuck, he's really close to a thousand points. That could be another angle. So am I going to sprinkle a couple of nickels on plus 550 for Connor to win the heart? Yes, I might just do that. Hmm. Can you imagine he's at 122 right now? Could you imagine if by the end he still, he gets close to 150 (laughs) thousand points. It would be right there. It'd be right there. He needs so he 28 needs, in his final yeah. 11 to get uh, to get to 1,000. <laughs> it's a tall order. But listen, <laughs> if there's anybody who can do it, he's number, it's 97. If he has a big night he, against Anaheim. How yeah. many points does he have in his last five games? We said 16? 14. He's got 16 in his last six games. <laughs> oh, boy. 14 and 6? 14 and 5. 14 and 5. Yeah, he's Do got again. 16 points in six games. Well, that's 28 points in 10 games. <clears throat> he's going to be right there. Oh, so he's what, stupid, man. What does he need to average? 28 and 11, so whatever, just under, like, two and a half. <laughs> Maybe a little less. And like, he played Anaheim and San Jose. It? I'm not. Oh, my goodness. They play Anaheim and San Jose to, in the last however many games. And Can Arizona. You- and here's the other angle is Connor's also starting to score goals again. Not when one, he's yeah. scoring goals and he's ripping shots and he scored last night, that's going to open up some avenues for him to pass to Hyman. Like there's can Connor get close? How close does Hyman get to 60? There's a bunch of stuff that's going to be fun to kind of watch down these last 11 games, just like pure point mark chases, but it's going to be fun to watch. I'm looking forward to it. There you go. Those are your betting odds for Bet99. Rich people find money on the ground or something like that. Or like you put your hand in your your pocket and you pull out a 20. It's just like the greatest moment ever. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Am I going to bet on Connor to get the Hart Trophy? Yes, I am. Thank you, Bet99, for the opportunity to take your money away from you. I appreciate it. Can I ask for one more odds update, Tyler? Mm, Yep. What are the odds for the Central Division? To win the Central? So while Tyler's looking that up, currently we are sitting Dallas's first place at 101 points. They clinched their playoff spot in second place, Colorado with 98 points in 73 games, Winnipeg in third, 94 points in 73 games, Nashville's at 90, St. Louis at 82, looking at the wild card race over on or in the West, I should say, LA is currently in the second wild card spot at 87 points, Nashville in the first at 90 points. Uh, Dallas is minus 210 to win the Central. Colorado's plus 180. And they play each other one more time. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And that Colorado is a game in hand, I believe. Correct. So yeah, you're basically, so- you could almost, it's not, this logic isn't fully lining up, but you could almost look at that as a plus 180 money line bet on the abs beating the Stars. And I think that game is in in Colorado, so you wouldn't get those odds. Mm. Like plus money on Colorado to win. Interesting, interesting stuff on Bet99. Lehman's looking for angles. He's got angles. Are you going to follow him down the rabbit hole? Just as we did yesterday with Jay's uh, healthy bet that he put in. You know, It did come close. It did did come close. Ah, It's good stuff. It is good, good stuff. I want to tell you, Tyler, I know you're always looking for summer activity plans. 
I know you are a, a gentleman who enjoys the outdoors. And I know you are a gentleman who enjoys a little bit of golf. And I know you're a gentleman that enjoys a little bit of camping. So why not set yourself up with a weekend to remember? Thanks to our friends at the Snow Valley Aerial Park and Rainbow Valley Campground. Opening on May 31st, family fun all summer long at the Aerial Park. Attractions include the Aerial Tower, White Mud Creek Mining Company, Target Golf, and the all-new Mini Golf. Creekside Eats will be open for snacks and refreshments. Watch for on-hill events all summer long. You want to do a little camping? I recommend you do. Opening May 15th this summer. Take advantage of over 60 sites and three comfort camping domes right here in the city. It is Edmonton's only campground. If you visit rainbow-valley.com, the online bookings are opening very, very soon. Do a little staycation in the city. Or if you're out of the city, why not come on down? What a weekend you could have. Do a little camping, hit the aerial park, smash some golf balls at the, at the ski hill. I love it. Everything about that little area is fantastic. Gentlemen, I've got three questions for you for Ask the Idiots this week. Uh, not one of them has to do with hockey, but it is Easter long weekend. So I've got some candy questions. I've got some long weekend questions. And i got some TV questions. That's the three. Tyler, you're up first on my list. What is the perfect long weekend for you? Hmm. Is it summer, winter? What season? Just any? Sure. Let's say this, uh, you know, we're in a long weekend right now. Let's, let's say this spring long weekend. Oh, well, it's probably not going to happen because of the weather. But this spring long weekend would have been perfect if I could have hit up a driving range. I think it's a little bit too chilly out today to do that. But maybe on Saturday or Sunday, I can swing that in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say hitting the driving range and having a beer outside at some point. Just the nice, crisp, fresh spring air and a cold beer. Mm, that's good. So beer and golf. Rick, what's the perfect long weekend for you? A couple of beers on the patio. Doesn't get better real than that. Simple, real simple. Man. Nice in the sun. Just hang out outside. Liam, you're mm. thinking of a perfect long weekend. What does that entail? You're starting off with Friday. You know, work it into Saturday. Mm -hmm. Monday, you know, you don't got to work. Yeah. Um, I like to camp on my long weekends, like through the spring and the summer. Actually, I would say just a to add a little bit more to this question may long is the most overrated long weekend of the year because you think it's going to be really warm but then you get to it and it's like super windy not actually that nice at all so the best long weekend is august long weekend when i go to when i go camping used to be bbj so that i'll say that going to bbj was the perfect long weekend i if we're going to pick our favorite of uh, Tyler, Rick, think of your favorite long weekend. Now that Liam had mentioned it, I'm going to go with September, the Labor Day long weekend. Yeah, that's a, a great one. Cooler in the evenings. You can still get your daytime activities in. But my favorite long weekend, if I'm planning out my ideal long weekend, it'd probably be going out to the lake, hanging out at the cabin, a couple of beers around the fire. Maybe I whip myself up a dog on there. Maybe mm. a handful of dogs. Awful. I think that'd be a really, really nice weekend for me. I got a fresh bag of spits and I'm just ripping those babies into the fire. Walk the dog, sit in the sun, a little bronze. I got my diamond and diamond on. Everything about that sounds lovely. Everything about that sounds lovely. Tyler, what is the ultimate long weekend? Which one? I think it's I think it's Labor Day. I think I agree. Like, you know, sometimes in the middle of summer, people are gone. They're on vacations, whatever. But like, I always feel like September long. People are usually in town. You can get together with your friends and everyone's kind of itching to make the most of the last long weekend before winter. Rick, what's the best long weekend? It's those four in the summer. It's June, July, August, September. Those are the four. You need to, you need to have it nice outside. And the May one isn't nice enough yet. Everything before that isn't nice. October, you're talking um, Thanksgiving, so that's that's beyond at that point. You need to be outside. It needs to be hot. It needs to be sunny. So I'm not going to pick one, but I'll just take those four nice ones in the summer. Just go with a full summer season. Yeah. One thing I will say that I will not slander May Long Weekend for these days specifically is May Long Weekend means Edmonton Oilers are in the playoffs. Yes. And that is fun to have some free days of zero responsibilities. You do a little <clears throat> drinking. Watch my beloved Edmonton Oilers. Round two. I'm going to reverse the order. Liam Horbin is up first. Question number two comes in from Jason. What is the best and worst Easter candy or chocolate? Um, the best is mini eggs. Of course. Yeah, that's the best. That's quite an easy one. 
Um, honestly, I don't eat a lot of chocolate, but I really don't like Easter eggs. I just feel like it's a lot. It's a lot of chocolate just in general. So just a general Easter egg. Rick, best and worst Easter chocolate candy. Just like standard chocolate is the best. Don't get fancy. Don't get crazy. And then the worst is anything with a creamy middle. Yeah. If you're getting a, if you're getting a bunny, you going solid or you going hollow? <sighs> That's a tough one. I think I'm going to go hollow. Yeah, I'm going hollow every time. I just like to be able to like snap it off and eat it like brittle. Pop that baby in the fridge or in the freezer. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Tyler, best and worst Easter chocolate or candy? Uh, yeah, I'll agree. Mini eggs, great. Any just sort of generic milk chocolate. Even sometimes you'll just like, you know, someone will have a little bowl out and you're like, ooh, these are like from the dollar store in the little mesh bag. Don't matter. They're electric. Any kind of milk chocolate's good. The worst one, easy. Fuck peeps. All my homies hate peeps. I was going to say, it's not even close. Peeps are awful. I don't even know why they still make those anymore. You put one in your mouth. Things? Yeah. yeah, they're like yeah, the pink yeah. ones or the yellow or the blue. Like, they're just awful. They're awful. So that is an easy answer for me. Uh, to be different a little bit. I also don't like Cadbury cream eggs, if I'm being honest. Yeah, me neither. I, I'm not a big... Don't I, I don't like the goo. Get the no, goo no. out of here. Uh, best, though, mini eggs is... They're, they're, I don't understand why they don't sell those year round. I mean, they probably do, but like they only come out prominently at Easter. I don't understand that at all. I would be eating those all year round if they were more prominently placed at my local establishment. Kind of like my guy Tyler's always got Sour Patch Kids. I'd always have that motherfucking thang on me if they were out. <laughs> Mini eggs. Last question. I'm starting with Rick. You're right in the middle. This one's going to take some thought, boys. It's going to take some thought. This one comes in from our, our boy, Dangerous Wade. Dangerous <laughs> Wade submitting a question. What is the best all-time TV theme song and Dangerous Wade will also award points to Liam if he sings along. <laughs> okay. I'll try. Theme song. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just I'll just go. Uh right. Friends. Like everybody knows the Friends theme Classic. song. It was an actual song. Yeah, I know. But it was great. So I mean, if I have to pick a regular one, I'll say I'll go a bit more modern and just say the office. The office is fantastic. Mm -hmm. See, this is a question by an older person, though, because you can tell there were a lot more beginnings to shows in the 80s and early 90s, where it is like they had a, a minute, minute and a half song or whatever, like introduce the characters or whatever. They don't really do that anymore. Not so you really. go back and like Baywatch had a good one. Oh, you would. A team had a good one. <laughs> like, there are some there are some good ones back from the 80s. <laughs> Tyler, what's the best TV theme song? Do you not always tap your feet when the Family Guy theme song comes on? Because again, it's like a song. It's not just a jingle. There's like lyrics to it. It's a production. They're all doing the big dance. I'll go with that. Ooh, uh, so just far. because I'm, I'm going to go with a show that I've loved since I'm 12 years old that is still on now. South Coronation Park. Street. Of course, Coronation Street, electric theme song, but I'm going with South Park. Yeah. The prime is nailed it. It's fun to sing along with. It's fun to pretend you know what Kenny's singing. The whole thing is good. <laughs> so shout out to South Park for still going. It is still on and it is still great. So there you go. Ask the idiots for our friends at Snow Valley and Rainbow Valley Campground. If you want to submit a question for the boys, they don't get to see these beforehand. Just slide on into my DMs. Just give me a little slide. Send pictures of Tyler or send pictures of Tyler to me. Send pictures of your feet to Tyler. Send questions <laughs> to me for Ask the Idiots. Got it? <laughs> Tyler nods yes. Tyler agrees. Tyler wants pictures of your feet. Before we wrap up the podcast with Hot and Cold Performers, Rick mentioned it earlier, and I just want to touch on it real, real quick. Could Connor Brown heating up down the stretch... I know Gregor says it's like having another trade deadline acquisition. I don't do that. But how impactful would it be if 20 goal pace Connor Brown ends up showing up down the stretch? The first goal he scored, junk. Charged to the net. Kane hit him in the legs, bounced, and that's the ugly one you need. Goal two. Pump. He shot that one, but it was basically into an open net. There was no goalie to be found. Pop that in. Goal three, however, was a fucking snipe. He ripped that thing and he buried it. So he oh, is the winning goalie. 
Yes, he did. Yes, he is. And he's looking like a guy who's starting to feel a little good about his game. Tyler, how impactful would it be? We're not talking about a trade deadline acquisition, as our boy Jason Greger said, but we are talking about a player who could be impactful. Maybe even, dare I dream, imagine I'm going to dream here, Rick. Give me a second. Pisani-esque down the stretch. Man, the Oilers need to get consistent production from their bottom six. So if you get, if Connor Brown starts scoring, like remember, after the preseason, we were sitting here talking about this guy scoring 25 goals as an Oiler. That's how high on him we were. I don't if think that he can, If he can score at a 20-goal <laughs> pace in the playoffs, that's two goals every series. If you get that, that's massive because it means your bottom six is actually producing consistently. So it would be massive, man. And if he has a good playoffs, Connor Brown back... Like eight, nine hundred K next year. Do I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't hate it if you get him close to a league man. Like, where else is he gonna go? Sometimes you sometimes you dance with the devil, you know, in a situation like this. Lehman, you said he wouldn't score again all season. Now he's got three. The last one was a beauty. What are your thoughts on just the impact Connor Brown could have down the stretch? Uh yeah, it would be it would be great. That fourth line, like Yamox. Contrib- not as contributing as much as he did in that little streak, but Carrick has nine goals on the season. You have Brown chipping in a bit more. Like I agree with what Tyler said. It just means that like your bottom six is doing something. And in that first round against the Kings last season, like there was a game six, like Clem and Yamamoto got huge goals for the team and they were playing in that bottom six. So you need that again. Mm-hmm. And I think it would also give him the option of trusting McDavid to go out there with, uh, sorry, I should say trusting Brown to go out there with McDavid in certain situations if you really need to try and push that as well. So, yeah, it would be massive. I'm not going to go with the approach either of, oh, it's a trade deadline acquisition because at the end of the day, Evander Kane hasn't scored in like 17 games either. So he's kind of just taking those goals away from what Evander Kane should be doing. Evander Kane, if he starts going, it would be a second trade oh. deadline acquisition. Yes. Rest with a little love for Connor Brown down the stretch here. Yeah, man, like... I don't really look at him as the Pisani, but I do look at him as like the Mike Pekka. Pekka really didn't have a good regular season in 06 with us. And then he started doing what he does in the playoffs. And Connor Brown has the exact same opportunity right now. So, yeah, anytime you get production out of your bottom six. And I kind of like when Gregor called it uh, the the addition there because it really angers some people on Twitter. So I'm going to stick with that. I like his, I like his, uh, his angle here. I mean, I don't care what the angle is. As long if Connor Brown starts producing, you can call him whatever you want. I'm just happy to see him score. Uh, before we get to hot and cold performers to wrap up the podcast, I want to just say nice to see some news from the Oilers depth chart this week. As prospect Noah Philp will be resuming his pro career next year after taking the season away from hockey. Six three, two hundred pound right shot center finished with 19 goals, 18 assists for 37 points in 70 games with the Condors. That's a uh, that's a really really nice piece of news for the Oilers depth chart. Love to see that. Yeah, it's great, man. I mean, I obviously called a ton of his games when he was with the Golden Bears at the U of A, and he is just he's a beast, man. He's a big boy, like you said, six foot three, but he moves so smooth. He's got such a heavy wrist shot. He's gone through so much personally and I really felt for him when it was announced that he was retiring last year and and didn't want to continue and you really hoped that some time away would allow him to get to a good spot where he wanted to play hockey again and where he felt like he could just operate on a day-to-day basis again which uh, I'm really happy to see this man and I think you know next year he'll probably need a season to get back up to speed but as a you know maybe 26 27 year old I could see him being an NHLer one day and getting up with the Oilers. Well, there wasn't there a lot of people at the start of the season saying he had a pretty good chance to make the team this year. Like, it'll be interesting. Like, a year of hockey isn't easy to come back from by any means. But now, going into camp next spring, like, what is he going to be able to do next fall? He's probably training full out right now, right? So, by the time camp comes around, he should be relatively ready to go for camp. So, it's going to be uh, at the very, very least, very least a really nice addition to the Bakersfield Condors, a really nice addition to the Oilers depth chart. And just like Tyler said, a really good story for a nice, uh, for a good young man. So 
Love to see that. That's some good news. Gentlemen, put your thinking caps on. It is time for Hot and Cold Performers. But first, I want to tell you about the game day viewing party we're hosting at Greta on April 6th. We are doing it in support of the Logan Hunter Memorial Fund. We are going to be watching the game. We're going to be enjoying ourselves. We're going to be just having a blast together, and we're going to be doing it all for a great cause. So if you go to nationgear.ca, currently... There are tickets available right at the top of the screen. 20 bucks for a ticket will get you in. You get a bunch of stuff there. You're going to have Tyler on the mic. You have the pregame show there. You're going to have the postgame show. The boys are all going to be there. They're going to have a great night down at Greta. And maybe, Lehman, you didn't hear this yesterday on Real Life, but I feel like you and Wa should be challenging each other to the football game. I'd like to see this because I don't think Waz knows how to throw. Uh, I would not be shocked by any means. And he, to be fair... He's had a lot to say for himself the last couple of weeks, so I think you're right. I think we will have to go 1v1 at Greta one of these days. You it's could wild. beat him left-handed. I could beat him with my eyes closed and my hands tied behind my back. I feel like this is the like humbling... Air wood. <laughs> it's humbling Waz needs after so rudely posting Liam's dark moment at the football game on our social over and over again, by the Three way. Three times! <laughs> <laughs> So watch out for that 1v1 coming. All right, gentlemen, we always start with our veggies here on Hot and Cold Performers. Again, nationgear.ca, our event at Greta on the April 6th. Go get your tickets. I am looking at Liam Horobin first. You are up. Your Cold Performer of the Week, sir. My Cold Performer of the Week is the Vegas Golden Knights. I really, really was hoping there would be a playoff race in the Western Conference and that Vegas would be hanging on by the skin of their teeth. But they keep winning, and I hate it. So the Vegas Golden Knights for actually being a good team. Ooh. Rick, you're up next for NationGear.ca, your cold form of the week. People who don't get into their seats before the period or the game starts. <laughs> I'm so annoyed by everyone walking down. It's like 822 or 1822 into the game, into the period. And people are still filing into their seats, 16, 25, and they're still coming down to their seats. And then the people that leave too early too. I'm very glad about that, the Henrique goal last night, because people are getting up and going to the bath and going to concession, doing whatever they want with, you know, a minute to go. I was like, guys, hold on. We can still, and bang, there's a goal that they all missed. So anybody just get to your seats before the damn face off. Start. Get out of the That's Rick. That is his uh, inner demons coming up. Tyler noted seat lever earlier. Oh yeah, I forgot. They did that against the Washington Capitals. <laughs> Didn't want to watch them pick up the hats for Zach Hyman. Your cold performer of the week, Tyler for NationGear.ca. My cold performer of the week. I honestly don't have a great one, so I'm just honestly going to give it to Blake Lazat just for existing, just for being himself. He sucks. Yeah, that's good. Fatality. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Tyler killed Blake Lazat there. See? See what happened? Loaded the gun. Now he's gone. Cold Farmer of the Week for me for NationGear.ca. I was just going to give it to the entire LA Kings team. They're so annoying. The 131, garbage to watch. I almost feel bad for LA Kings fans if they weren't so insufferable that they have to watch that. But they I don't. You in the back of the head with a beer. You don't feel sorry for them. Well, that's what I mean. I said I almost feel sorry for them, but I don't because they're insufferable. And remember, in this economy, someone threw a twenty-dollar U.S. beer at my head in L.A. Hit me and dr and drenched the poor lady behind me. Rude <laughs> people, very rude people, and just like again, the Lazat slew foot, the Mikey Anderson whining and the when he's laying in the in in. You know, when after Zach Hyman cross checked him, just the whole thing is annoying. I don't like him, but I very much would love to see a round three in that trilogy for the playoff series. It would just be fun. Emotional damage. <laughs> Let's wrap it up with some positives. Gentlemen, we are reversing the order. Tyler Remchuk, you were up first. Your nationgear.ca hot performer of the week. Go buy tickets April 6th, the viewing party. Go see Tyler live in action. 
My hot performer of the week is Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who single-handedly restored my hope and optimism in the Toronto Blue Jays this year by murdering a baseball 450 feet. He looking slim thick this year. He's moving well. He's crushing baseballs, and he's got this sick-ass Barry Bonds-style dangling earring that is giving me life. Vladimir Guerrero Jr., hot performer of the week. Jesus. What's what? that? What is? I don't it? know. Oh, you got to react. I don't know. I just it says fun music is what it says on my board here. I don't know. Can you click it again? Not familiar. No, I think it's from like a. I, I think it's from like an Atco commercial or something. If I remember correctly, Rick, you're up. <laughs> you're up next. Your nation gear does say hop from the week. I know everybody, uh, they had really nice things to say about him. Uh, I think it was on the weekend when he was doing his thing. But uh, Luke Gazdick, everything he's doing right now on TV, uh, we don't exactly get the best option in terms of analysis on uh, in hockey games right now. I think TNT does a lot better job than we're getting out of Sportsnet. But I think what, what Luke is doing right now is actually really, really impressive. I, I really enjoy watching him. Let's go, baby. Shout out to Luke Gazdick. I actually, when he was on Hockey Night in Canada as well, I thought that the back and forth between him and BX was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liam, you're up next. Your NationGear.ca Hot Performer of the Week. My Hot Performer of the Week. I will give it to... I was at the JPL last weekend, and that place is awesome every time we go. So, the JPL. They asked me if I had ever seen... <laughs> They asked me if I had ever seen the Queen's Suite before, and I said, indeed. Yeah! Got a weird night in there, if I'm being honest. (laughs) (laughs) Queen not present, though. No, no. Only in spirit. Mm -hmm. We could feel it. it. Uh, Hot performer of the week for me is, it's it's an easy one. Um, It's the layup, so I'm going to take it. Connor McDavid is playing out of his mind right now. And that's not abnormal. We've seen him do it countless times in his career where he goes on these heaters where you go, I don't know if he can get any better than this. And then he just goes and gets better than this. But this season is unique in that way because of how, quote unquote, slow the start of his year was. If you look, he was very like, he was still putting up solid numbers for a mere mortal early in the year, but not Connor McDavid numbers. So to see him racing up the leaderboard the way he has now, only two back in Nikita Kucherov is unbelievable. Connor McDavid for nationgear.ca, my hot performer of the week. As we're going to wrap up the podcast here, gentlemen, the Oilers have a big game tomorrow against the Anaheim Ducks. Dare I say a must win, even though it's not mathematically one of those games. It's one of those ones where you look at it. I don't want them looking past the Anaheim Ducks is, I guess, my bigger point. I want them going into that game like that is the most important task they have remaining all season. And I want them to absolutely stomp Anaheim. Mm -hmm. I want a revenge goal from Adam Henrique. I want revenge goal from Sam Carrick. I want a revenge goal from Corey Perry. I want it all. So Perry I have, probably plays tomorrow, then, right? I mean, I would. You would think so. I think Nobby would give him a little love there, don't you think? I think you mm-hmm. have to. I think you have to. We'll see. We'll see. Of course, no lineup information out just yet. But I want to ask your score prediction. We're going to predict the future. Tyler Remchuk, you're up first. Your score prediction tomorrow: Anaheim Ducks, two p.m. start. Rogers plays. Go. Uh, I'm going to say seven three Oilers. Woo! We are betting the peck line in the Castle Yerem Chuck. Rick, score prediction. I should know better than this, and I should take a low score because that's probably what's going to happen, but I'm going 5 nothing Edmonton. Liam? I'm going 6-2 Edmonton. 4-2 win coming at you. You're going to put a couple of shekels down. The odds are always great, and they're delicious. Big win coming tomorrow. You can see it. I can feel it. Final thoughts, Tyler, before we wrap it up? Uh, I think Connor McDavid will get five points tomorrow. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. What's up, Nation citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube. Podcasts, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it, so hammer that subscribe button.